Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's premier talk show about Gnosticism, the esoteric, mysticism, Buddhism, meditation, enlightenment, non-dualism, Dzogchen, Tantra, and whatever else we feel like talking about. Uh, tonight we have a special co-host in our rotating cast of co-hosts. We have Father John DeGilio joining us from LA. Hello, Father John. Hello, everyone. Well, hi. So glad to have you here and to have you back on the show. And also for returning to the show, we've got Greg from A Cult of Personality, Mr. Greg Kaminsky. Hello, Greg. Hello. Thanks so much for having me back. It's great to be here again. Uh, it's it's a real honor. Uh, it's a real joy. Uh, if you don't know a cult of personality, uh, it turns out we're not the only esoteric podcast. We're not the, <laughs> the only one out there. However, the only one that's you know as good would definitely be Greg's. Um, the <laughs> Thank you. We we have a very exciting topic to talk about with Greg tonight with, with a show that's so far on calling Tantra, Zogchen, and Western Esoterica. Um, this is uh, actually a personal topic, uh, a topic that's personal to me. I didn't actually mention this to Greg, but my, my in-laws, my father-in-law, my mother-in-law are passionate uh, Tantric practitioners and uh practitioners of Dzogchen, and they've talked to me about it before, and I still don't understand it. I really hope that Greg can clear it up for me. <laughs> um, but before we get to that, uh, I'm going to do a quick commercial. Uh, I don't like doing it. You don't like hearing it, but it's important, which is for our Patreon. So it's patreon.com slash Gnostic. We literally can't do the show without uh, the support of viewers like you. Uh, we do have to spend money to make the show. We don't have any money, therefore, to break even. We do need donations. You can donate as little as $1 per piece of media per month through Patreon. The other thing you can do, too... Because we do want to introduce more shows. I want to get back to blogging. Sometimes we have five shows a month. Uh, you can set a limit. So if you don't want to pay any more than $5 a month, you can set that there. Uh, the other thing, too, if you want to do a one-off donation, you don't want to make a monthly uh, commitment, you can do it through paypal.com slash Gnostic. And finally, I know that these are particularly difficult times. We completely understand if you want to support the show and can't do it with uh, dirty, dirty money. What you can do to help us out is like and subscribe on YouTube, like and subscribe on your uh, favorite podcatcher, leave us reviews, tell people about the show, uh, post it on your social media. So thank you again to all of the wonderful Gnostic Elite, all of the wonderful patrons that we have out there, and for everybody who enjoys the show. So the commercial is over. <laughs> it's time to get into the extremely good stuff. So, Greg... You've been involved with Western Esoterica for quite some time now. Yeah. How did you get involved with Eastern Tantra? Um, so, let's see. It was probably around 2009, 2010. I began speaking with um, David Hyam Smith and did a series of interviews with him about his books, um, starting with the Kabbalistic Mirror of Genesis book. And uh, one of the things he was always talking about was this non-emanationist Kabbalah, which is clearly different than Kabbalah, like the traditional Kabbalah, which is emanationist. And um, so he's like, he's got this like non-dual uh, sort of thing happening. And uh, so I was really intrigued by that. And I asked him more about it and he said, well, I have a teacher and I just assumed this teacher was some Kabbalistic teacher. Um, but come to find out, no, that was not the case. Um, this teacher was a teacher of Tantric Buddhism and uh, it wasn't till many, many years later, till probably 2000, 17, I think, that I actually ended up meeting um, this teacher, um, who is now my teacher, and uh, his name is Traktung Kepa Rinpoche. Um, he's American born, but um, he teaches this uh, Buddhist tradition. And uh, it's, it's way more radical than anything I'd ever experienced prior so um 
like there's elements that I recognize on a superficial level, but the way things are done and the intensity is just completely different. Well, speaking of intensity, Greg, I've been following you for years. I don't know how long I've been, I've been following you now. And, you know, I appreciate only, that. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Not <laughs> only am I ever in awe of not just how much you know, but the passion with which you pursue these topics, these interests, and the sincerity with which you speak on them. Uh, for the sake of our audience, people who might not be familiar with Tantra, how would you break that down? What is it? Well, that's a good question because I think in the modern West, we have like a lot of misconceptions about Tantra and what it is, what it isn't. Um, so, you know, to really, to speak on this subject in, a, in an accurate sort of way, I can't just sort of define Tantra for you because like as soon as we enter into that conversation, there's all sorts of axioms and assumptions and preconceptions that, that I'm going to have that you're not having. And it's just, it's, so we're not really on the same page. So where we really have to begin in talking about this is, um, the view. So in Buddhism, typically it's, it's taught and practiced in terms of view, meditation and conduct. So right. view, this would be like a perspective or a worldview or a view of reality. And so the view I'm talking about here is where um, reality is simply the divine knowing itself in this sort of playful, frolicking dance, if you will. And that's all it is. There's nothing else. Um, so then it gets into like, well, what is the, the problem? And the problem is that our perception, we mistake this luminous openness of divinity for a subject, which is ourselves and objects in the world, which is all phenomenon. And so that creates this like dichotomy and a feeling of separation. But even more than that, it creates this sense of beingness itself which is the feeling that I am, that I exist, that I'm alive, which we all have. Um, so in that sense, according to the view of Buddhist Tantra or Vajrayana, this is like uh, going astray mm -hmm. from reality. And, and not it's, and they say sort of the, the way it's translated is like a mistake or something, but it's not really a mistake because it's like, this is just the way our mind functions. And, uh, it's the way we have to navigate the world. And so that's just how it is. And, um, and so then that you have this, the spiritual path functions as a way to sort of, depending on your point of view, either purify or transform one's perception. So all is then perceived as divinity, knowing itself in playful frolic. So, that's the view and it's also the path and it's also the result. And so they call this the resultant path because everyone has this sort of, they call it Buddha nature, or you might call it the nature mm -hmm. of mind, which is really, I think a better word for it is mentation, which is what it means is like the way the mind functions, but without this, sort of subject object dichotomy sort of prior to that um and that is gnosis according to this view and so we all possess that but our 
the obscuration of ourselves essentially the way we perceive obscures recognizing it mm -hmm. and so then the spiritual path which is the methods the of the path of tantra then work to sort of undo this obscuration of perception and sort of purify it or transform it right um, right and then you could break it down further like tantra is uh the word tantra itself means like we to weave um and so one way they they talk about it is um sort of weaving together like different methods of esoteric practice like you could have like sort of like the yogic practice and you could have the aesthetic monastic practice or you could have like a devotional style of practice or you could have like a purely intellectual like inquiry style of practice but so tantra tries to weave all these styles together into one so when you're doing meditation you're trying to do all of these things simultaneously or like at various points during the practice at least Right. Before Deacon Jonathan hits you with his next question, you know, <laughs> let, me, let me just say that, you know, for those who have been studying Gnosis, Western esotericism, a lot of this should sound eerily familiar as much yeah. as it may sound foreign. So thank you for that. That's exactly what I was angling for. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, precisely. And and actually to, to pause for, for a moment, just to the to, to build on what, what Father John was saying is, I, you know, I actually was listening to one of your interviews, your, your latest one, which I think was from earlier this year with, with uh, David Heim Smith about his, his new book. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, this is, I got to send this to my father-in-law. This sounds like the Zogchen stuff mm -hmm. he's, he was talking to me about. This this sounds like Eastern non-duality. So, so it, it is, but but he's coming from a, from a Western perspective. But it turns out, of course, that he too, I didn't realize that he he had the same teacher as you. So it is interesting to to see these connections. And of course, this does sound like a, some some other things that, that I have encountered in in the Western traditions. And it, it is actually a shame that we can't have our, our good friend, the good friend with, with both the listeners and everybody on this show, um, uh, Father Tony Sylvia on tonight, because he's he's gotten very, very passionate about uh, non-duality and non-dual practices and bringing non-duality into Western Gnosticism. And mm -hmm. that'll be a, a future panel, I'm sure. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, but moving on, as, as Father John was saying, barreling down to the next question, uh, Greg, very important question that, that I think a lot of people who are watching or listening have is, do you have to convert to Buddhism, to uh, a Tibetan religion like Bon, or another Eastern faith uh, to practice this? Because we, we associate Tantra with with Eastern religions like Bon, Buddhism, and Hinduism. So do, do you have to convert? you have to become uh, a full Buddhist and uh, take refuge and find a teacher and do the whole nine yards? Well, I mean, that's an interesting question because, like, at least the way it was presented to me by my teacher was, like, you don't really have to stop doing or being anything that you already are or in any way that you naturally are. Um, so like he, he all, always talks about how we're all Protestant at heart, no matter what religion we were brought up in as <laughs> Americans, we're all just Protestants. Yeah. And so uh, I recognize that. And then on another level, like I was raised uh, in the Jewish religion. And so I have that background and then I have, also background in esoteric Christianity. So there's a, a lot going on sort of like in my background. And he never said like, you have to convert or give up anything or change your beliefs. It was basically like, if you want to practice this path, you know, the, the guru is like the foremost uh, aspect <clears throat> of the whole thing. So without the guru, there is no path at all because you have to have the enlightened master who can transmit the view and the methods and demonstrate realization to inspire faith and the whole thing. And then beyond that, I think um, there is refuge 
And then there is the aspect of, you know, whenever doing meditation practice, uh, dedicating the virtue or merit to all beings. And so if one does those things, I think one is automatically sort of a Buddhist. Uh, whether or not one can still considers themselves a Christian or a Jew or whatever other religion one might follow. And I don't think those things are necessarily exclusive or have to be uh, separate. Um, I think Buddhism, especially in Vajrayana and Tantra, kind of embraces this and other forms as well, really. Like, mm -hmm. uh, this idea of sort of interpenetrating, but mutually non-obstructive so you can have ideas or beings or whatever sort of like mingling together and there's there's no sort of concept of uh blockages or obstructions or separations and um and that's not just sort of a philosophical idea like that is at the view itself like you know that is the view and i and i should mention this view is 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 Dzogchen. It's so it's the practice is Buddhist Tantra, but it's from this Dzogchen view. And that is, uh, it, as far as I understand it, that is somewhat particular to certain lineages uh, within Buddhist Tantra. Yeah. Um, how similar is it, in, in your opinion, and and you know, you're sort of at this point vast experience to to Western esoteric paths, and and where is it different? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think it's similar in that on some level, Western esoteric paths exalt the idea of gnosis and the sort of classical pursuit of knowing oneself. But I think the sort of inherently fragmentary nature of Western esoteric paths by and large seem to prevent that realization from happening. Because it's interesting, I you find like complete spiritual realization within Western religious paths that are, you know, not quite so esoteric, like uh, orthodox monasticism, for an example, or um, certainly within uh, Hasidic Jewish Kabbalism, you would find it, or certainly within uh, Sufism, Islamic Sufism, you find it. Um, and there's probably other places as well. I, I can recall like, you know, specific, like, uh, was her name Bernadette Roberts? The, mm. and so like you have examples of this, uh, cropping up, but you, I, I'm not familiar with any examples in sort of the Western esoteric milieu. And, um, so I think part of it is like, there's the exaltation of Gnosis, but there's really not the realization of it. And then there's methods and symbols and ostensibly paths, um, but they don't, at least from my experience, they don't produce the type of transformation that I've seen in at least with my teacher and his close students, like it's, but, but then I, if I think about it really, there, there's no real comparison. I mean, one's got a living master and then he's constantly teaching and creating circumstances for people to practice and then encouraging them to do more practice. And so, I don't know. I mean, like I'd never imagined it was even possible to do like eight to 12 hours of practice a day for like many days in a row. 
but it is. And so if you do that and you've got a living master who's like actually accomplished the path already and then methods that work, like it's a, it's totally different experience Mm -hmm. in my opinion. So, um, but it's also more difficult and there's, it's more challenging and, uh, demanding in many ways but i think in order to get results you kind of have to be willing to engage with a path that is demanding and uncompromising and that goes really right back to uh the founder of the tradition known as guru rinpoche because his realization was completely uncompromising and if you talk about like non-duality like and cutting through every single concept until not a single one remains uh like and so he that that realization which is the exact same realization or gnosis that every single one of the living masters in that chain of union um had so it's like it's the same mind uh it's completely uncompromising and and in many ways that you could say is like ruthless towards Mm -hmm. any sort of sense of identity or uh conceptuality or um self-concern at all um so so that's uh but yet still like completely tender-hearted and loving and Mm -hmm like caring about beings, you know, and trying to, you know, eliminate suffering. So, yeah, it's, so I think it's pretty interesting from that perspective. Um, Well, I think you make an interesting contrast there. And I want to sort of come back to that because you're, I think you're onto something with the idea of the guru versus sort of the way we do things more in the Western esoteric sense, where at least in the many of the Gnostic churches, you find there's an aversion, uh, whether it's spoken or, or not, you know, to the idea of having a guru-like relationship. There's more of an onus on the individual to sort of figure things out for themselves. And I know that that's often what's difficult for many people when they first come to Western esotericism is many of us come from a background where you have some kind of guidance and you, you kind of need that. So this is often something that's on my mind as, and Jonathan, you can speak to this as well as somebody, you know, who ministers within the Western esoteric traditions is, you know, at what point are we guiding people versus telling them you have to find your own way? And as a 20 year practitioner of Buddhism myself, uh, I actually enjoy those types of relationships um, with trusted teachers, gurus. So I think that's a very interesting point you make there. Yeah, yep. thank you. Um, I think it is interesting, and it's really, I think, difficult for a lot of people in the modern age to sort of submit themselves to someone who they would then like put on a pedestal as like the expert, right? But if you think about it rationally, like if you want to learn anything, you submit yourself as a student to the teacher who knows more than you do because they've done it and accomplished it. Like you want to learn to cook. So then you go to school and the chef is your teacher and you submit to them as the expert because they know how to cook and you want to learn how to cook. So this is exactly the same type of thing. Um, There's other ways you could think about it too. Like, Um, In Christianity, like right from the get-go, it's a master-disciple relationship, right? So the entirety of the the religion, religious faith tradition is built upon that master and his relationship with his disciples and his relationship with all of us. Um, 
and so even in like uh, in Orthodox monasticism, they have a Staretz who is the teacher master who prevents the disciple from falling into error or mistakes or um, in Sufism, it's the same. You have the master, like in Rumi's poems mm -hmm. about Shams, you know, how at least like this overwhelming devotion to his master. Um, I mean, and even in Western esotericism, you have like in Freemasonry, you have the master of the lodge and a whole hierarchy of officers. Um, the same in like any sort of golden dawn or any similar type of order. There's a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, Still there. And, yeah, and, and it was always the case, I think, up until fairly recently that it was assumed that if you were going to make some sort of progress on a spiritual path, that you would have superiors acting as initiators and teachers and guides. And I think it's really with like the new age and new thought and things like chaos magic and you have this idea of like self-initiation or um, this American sort of, you know, do it yourself sort of attitude where I'm like, I'm self-sufficient. I can do it myself, but the, we, we can't really do it ourselves. And the fact is like Gnosis is such a rare, rare thing that, the the idea that one could like stumble into it by trial and error with some books and some youtube videos is so patently outrageous to me that it it almost defies belief but yet there's plenty of people out there who who believe that's possible i there's even people out there who don't even think enlightenment's a real thing so Mm. You know, they think Gnosis is just some term or some like brief experience that they had one night or, you know what I mean? So I, I don't know what to say to those people. Yeah, we um, we actually have a whole show with Father John, which I will put down in the show notes called What is Enlightenment? Um, which maybe a, it's a question I have on the secret question sheet. I'm sorry, people. We actually do have a question sheet. Uh, <laughs> secret is out. I put it down a little bit below, but it's. I, I think it's a, a good place to stick it in right now, which is, uh, Greg, do you believe in enlightenment? I suspect that perhaps the answer is yes. And and do you think that, that, that everyday people, that people can achieve it? Yes and yes. So I, I know that it's a real thing not only because I've seen it in other, in others, um, but I've, I mean, I've also like experienced brief moments of it myself. I'm not saying that I'm enlightened or anything of that nature. I'm not, but uh, I, I've had like little tastes of what that state of mind is. And um, so when I speak about it, I'm not completely like making something up. Um, so yeah, it's a real thing. Uh, it's possible that the mind can sort of resolve itself in, and the perception sort of allows one to see reality as it is instead of as we are. Um, and it is different is vastly vastly different because one when one is in that state there is no i so the beingness is gone and so if there's no i then there's no thou right there's no there's no me there's no you and there's no god even there's nothing but perception's still happening and there's still all of this so um yeah, I'm not saying it makes any sort of rational sense, but um, there are beings that exist in that state sort of 24-7 in a stable manner. And, um, and they have compassion for us because we don't see reality. And most of the time when we encounter them, we have some level of devotion because we recognize that that Gnostic state is divine. 
like that is the all knowing state. Um, it doesn't mean that um, when one achieves it, one becomes God. It just means that uh, I don't know how, like Meister Eckhart, when he said like um, the eye with which I see God and with God sees me is the same eye. It's the same mind, the same heart. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's like you can't know God, but you can kind of sort of be it or sort of be in that state. Um, and so, and it is possible if one, I think, um, you know, has a devotional relationship with a being who is able to transmit that view and that the methods to a, attain that state um, it doesn't mean it will happen it but it only happens to people who do those sorts of things right well talk about those sorts of things what are those sorts of things like what are some of the practices th that you do and it also um because i'm also a follow-up question is not asked enough. Uh, how do you think that, th that these practices have directly affected your life or, or changed you? Yeah, that's a good question. So, well, it starts with um, like understanding this sort of view of reality. You know, it's all just divinity knowing itself and playful frolic and sort of then from there, sort of learning like bef I think the first step was really learning these uh, pre-preliminary considerations which I think for, are familiar to most Buddhists where you have like the you know the four noble truths right you know there is suffering and and there's a path to the end of suffering and there's an end of suffering and um there's also these uh four thoughts that turn the mind to dharma um, precious human birth uh, impermanence karma and again suffering um and then there's the six perfections which are sort of ways of enacting virtuous conduct things like generosity and patience and paramitas yeah so these are these are sort of ways of being in the world but it also includes like meditation and wisdom so um it's also spiritual practice as well as like worldly sort of ways of treating other people um and so once you sort of understand those on a sort of existential level where it, it kind of exposes you to this understanding that you're really in a fortunate situation at the moment being born as a human being with the opportunity to attain gnosis so you because attaining that state automatically ends suffering right because if you remember what i said like there's no you there's no there's no me there's no you there's no god there's so there's no it's just like this i don't know what you'd call it this field of like divine knowingness and so automatically that eliminates suffering of yourself and if there's no other beings essentially there can't be you know they they on some level they can't really suffer it doesn't mean they don't it just means that you you see through their suffering more than they can in those moments um and so that sort of this gnostic state becomes like the the sort of like the ultimate healing like the elixir of life or the philosopher's stone it's like that's what it is um so it's analogous to those things in in alchemy or it may be the same thing depending on your view right and there's a beautiful practicality to it all which is something that 
again, when I hear people ask the question, you know, what are your practices? What are your, often we stop to think about very specific things people think they have to do during the course of the day. Like there's a checklist. Um, what you said, Greg, and what r really rings, of, you know, with me is that you start with sort of the basics. There's almost a book learning to it. So you learn about the paramitas, you learn about all these other things, but the practicality of it all is this is something that you can live on a daily basis. It's not always having to stop and say something, do something. Yes, those practices actually do exist, but for the most part, what you're talking about is building a, uh, a living practice, a living tradition, if you will. Yes, exactly. The, these these concepts, where well, they start out as concepts, but they become like a living structure that you inhabit, right? So yes, you're right. It's not something where you would necessarily have to stop and even say something or think about it because it just becomes who you are, right? A natural reaction just arises like without any sort of prompting because it's just been so integrated into your beingness mm -hmm. um, and then i think once one does that then there's the the preliminary practices they call um nongdro which uh that involves a outrageous number of accumulations of of different practices um, refuge, compassion, um, purification, offerings, and then a, a, a sort of practice of, of unification, I guess you would call it. Um, and each one of these, you have to do 111,000 times. It's 111,111 ,111 for each of them. So refuge practices like full body prostrations, uh, the compassion or bodhicitta practice is, is just really some prayers and visualization. The purification practice is uh, Vajrasattva uh, meditation and mantra. And the, then there's the mandala offerings where you basically offer outer, inner, and secret offerings. So it, you basically end up offering like everything, like including yourself, your possessions, your family, your world, your perception, like your beingness, and then like wisdom itself. And then, then the unification practice is called guru yoga. So that's where you do like a week long retreat of specific visualization and mantra and uh, certain practices that allow you to, if you've done all this entire process authentically and with intensity, then in this week long retreat, you get this sort of tongue tip taste of gnosis and then because then from there, you it's like, wow, I've done all this work. But then in that moment, you realize, oh, like, I haven't done anything yet. Like, if anything, this is like just opens the door to like actually being able to do real practice. And then from there, it goes into what's called deity yoga. And there's different phases of deity yoga practice, but it basically involves visualization and mantra of a specific deity and um yeah it gets it can get very complex but um on another level it's uh it's like it's very simple because it's like the practice is um it's intense but it it you can like you the effects are rapid, like they're way more rapid than anything I've been ever done before. Really, yeah. Um, Greg, uh, the 
I'll, I'll tell a long rambling story before I get to the, the question, which is, uh, this is all your fault, right? This is your fault. This, this, is, this is your doing. Because almost a decade ago, uh, I joined a Martinist Lodge. I became very interested in Martinism. I was Googling around the, the search terms Martinism and podcast. And then I, I found A Cult of Personality, your interview with uh, Father Tony Sylvia of the Apostolic Joe and I Church. And I'm like, What's, what? There's a Gnostic church out there? Well, I got to look into that. And here we are almost a decade later. So you've been doing your show for a long time. You've been involved with occultism and Western esotericism for a long time. People, you know, they tweet at you. They send you emails. They want to discuss with you. Um, so would you recommend to occultists out there that they look into Tantra? And if you do recommend this, you know, what might an occultist bring to this path that others may not? Uh, that's a good question. So really, I couldn't in good faith recommend this path to most occultists. Okay. Because um, this is, it's really a path that's specifically for um, people who have come to some understanding that their need to understand truth or reality outweighs their clinging to any sort of identity or self-concern or ideas about um, I don't know what you'd call it, like career or advancement or some sort of like, um, you know, using some sort of measuring stick for success. It, it really, you'd have to um, come to some level of true, like, understanding about the the nature of futility in terms of like a materialistic worldview and the the sort of suffering that is completely endemic like to our our world um that that ultimately like we as individuals we can't do really anything about even even for other people that we know we, we can we can barely offer you know a modicum of comfort most of the time if we're lucky and um so it, i think it requires like coming to grips with that and realizing like unless i'm willing to sacrifice myself for that cause then it's not the path for for somebody um is it it's a tremendous amount of work and and all of that work none of it has to do with like making oneself look better or feel better or like any sort of self-improvement in any way shape or form it's the path of giving up and getting nothing back it's of eventually like it's the path of giving up everything because gnosis or wisdom is ultimately to it sort of achieve that one has to like unknow and ear realize and like sort of get rid of conceptuality altogether um so it becomes like a divestment. And I don't think that's what most people are interested in esotericism for. Which is okay. You know, I'm not not judging. And I'm not trying to shame anyone or, or trying to say like, these are standards or virtues to which people should live up to. No, they're not. It's just something some people feel a compulsion for and for those people it's makes sense 
And um, I don't know, for me, really, it was just, I feel compelled, like I need to know this. And not knowing on one level, like was killing me slowly. So I was, I'm willing to do the work it takes to know, which is, as it turns out, way more than I bargained for. (laughs) (laughs) Oh man, unfortunately we're, we're already in the home stretch, but before I get to the last question or two, uh, Father John, do you have any follow-up questions, uh, thoughts, uh, the things you want to add, anything you want to get in there? Um, Just one thing I'd like to, again, for the sake of our audience, come back to, and that is a a term you had used earlier, Greg, and that is Zogchen. Um, You know, we talked about what Tantra was for the sake, again, of giving our our folks just a basis to work from. What is Zogchen? Zogchen is, first of all, it's the view I expressed earlier, again, this all reality is just the divine knowing itself and playful frolic. But it's also considered the highest level of tantric practice in Buddhism. And so the thing is, the practices in tantra can be quick and seemingly very simple. But one can't do these practices if one hasn't done the entire path prior. Okay, so if someone... And I don't mean to bust anyone's bubble here, but if someone, and this is just what I've been taught, so I'm just repeating what I've been taught by my teacher. Um, So you have to practice the entirety of the path in order to even get to the stage where you'd be given these teachings. So prior to Dzogchen, where you're doing deity yoga, but it's not You start out with generation phase, then you move into completion phase, and there's other aspects of completion phase. But one doesn't even do completion phase deity yoga practice because the deity's doing the practice at that point, right? So a a person can't practice Dzogchen. That can't happen. A deity, the deity practice does the practice. And so this is, again, like there's intricacies with the teachings and these methods and the view, but the way the deity yoga works, like if you, like if you've done the generation phase of deity yoga properly, then you would never even assume that you could engage in the completion phase practice as you because you wouldn't be you anymore, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Because right. you you practice the, you've imputed your I, your I am onto the deity to such a great extent. Like you've done, you know, millions of mantra accumulations and practice this for years. And like, when you think of yourself, you don't think of this, you think of the deity, like, boom, automatically. It's just a reflex. So then you can move into these other levels of practice where then the deity is doing the practice, not Greg or some human being. So that's where I think a lot of people get tripped up in thinking somehow they can skip the entirety of the path and jump right to Dzogchen and then practice Dzogchen because that just... According to what I've been taught, that's simply impossible and doesn't work. And it's like a a pretense in a way. So, but then to do the entirety of the path and then to get to that level of practice is really profound and tremendous, Um, you know, and, and would have to indicate some level of spiritual realization. Um, you know, however stable or not it may be at that point, but still. Um, and the other thing too about when we talk about gnosis or these high levels of practice, uh, one can be technically enlightened and still a student and still have to practice every day and still, you know, 
engage in all of these practices and views and considerations and everything without any sort of cessation. In fact, it only becomes deeper and deeper and deeper because it, it totally subsumes your habits and mm -hmm. normal, like other activities and identity. And so there's just nothing else left really. And so then it's like, you know, it's, that's what I talk about, like accomplishing meditation without meditation. It's just like, just your way of being is just totally subsumed by the practice. But it's, it's hard to even conceptualize unless you've met beings who are that way. Right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, unfortunately, uh, the, we do have to wrap it up, although I could, we could go all night. Slash I, a I a love live... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Another you know, time, right? perhaps. Yeah, another time. Yes, we'll, we'll, do, <laughs> we'll do a 12-hour live stream. Uh, but uh, before we sign off, uh, let's do some plugs. Greg, tell people uh, uh, you know what you do, where people can find you online, all that good stuff. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, again, uh, the podcast is called Occult of Personality. You can find it at all the places you get your podcasts. Uh, also, the website is occultofpersonality.net. You can find me on Twitter at Occult of Personality, um, more or less. Um, also on Patreon, patreon.com slash Occult of Personality. I have a, a tremendous amount of uh, archived exclusive material for patrons, as well as for members of our membership website, which is called the Chamber of Reflection at chamberofreflection.com. And if you sign up for the Patreon or the Chamber of Reflection to hear these exclusive interviews and presentations that helps support the podcast and keeps me going and allows me to keep bringing you really what I think is amazing quality esoteric content um, that continues to sort of push boundaries and question assumptions and allow us to connect with different traditions and paths and hopefully make progress so thank you guys very much it's really a pleasure to reconnect with you and talk with you again and uh, be on talk gnosis oh it's been so awesome uh, to, to have you back on yeah thank you it's it, it's been great and uh and obviously we we think of you as uh as part of the family and uh we're glad that you're back on and we will have to do it again sometime uh yeah. Father John, I'm oh, sorry. Father John, do you do you have any any plugs before before we say goodnight? Uh, just to say, if you're ever out here in the Los Angeles area, feel free to look us up. I can be found at Saint Joachim AJC org, and that's for our AJC parish out here, uh, Saint Joachim of Fiore Apostolic Johannite Church. So. It's good to also have been back and to have reconnected with everyone. Thank you so much, Deacon Jonathan. Oh, it, it, it's been amazing to, to have you on as well, Father John. And uh, as we were saying before, the cameras were rolling way, 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 way too long since uh, we've both spoken, seen each other, and uh, done a done a broadcast like this. So I, I will sign off with a quick plug. Uh, you know, I have my HAC Parish uh, here in Montreal, but I doubt if you're watching this show, you don't already know about it. You're a Montrealer who somehow hasn't heard, but it is a uh, Holy Grail uh, HAC. Give us a Google. We're doing some stuff online. But talking about stuff online that perhaps you may want to do, I do have some training and I have worked as a secular mindfulness coach. Okay. So I'm, I'm definitely not an enlightened being, uh, but I can uh, give you some tips for meditation and get you going. Uh, and help you build a daily practice. So uh, I used to teach live in person here in Montreal. Now we're doing it online at milelandmeditation.substack.com. You can go there. Uh, Substack's great because it's both a blog and an email newsletter. So you can check out uh, by going to that site any announcements that we have. You can also sign up for the email newsletter. Generally, what we do is uh, we meditate together once a week, uh, usually Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, everything is free. 
free. It's it's by donation, but if you don't want to donate, you don't have to. Also, I I do want more experience doing some one-on-one -on -one coaching. If you've been wanting to set up a meditation practice or you're struggling and you feel stuck in your practice, give me a holler through mileendmeditation.substack.com and uh, hopefully I can be of some assistance. So this is Deacon John signing off. Thanks so much, and uh, we will see you all next episode. Good night. Good night, everyone.